Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. Now, one of the biggest advantages we have in backyard astronomy is the existence of what are called German equatorial mounts or equatorial mounts. This allows us to follow stars as they rotate through the sky as the Earth rotates beneath them. Now, in order to do that, we have to polar align these mounts. So today I'm going to take a moment and I'm going to show you how to polar align a German equatorial mount. So let's cue up the music and get going. Now this is the screen on the laptop that I use for my telescope. Now last night I set this up and I wanted to just get some video on how to do a polar alignment. So the first step in doing a polar alignment is that you have to align your guide scope and your main optical tube. Now the way that I have it set up right now is that the color screen is my main optical tube and last night we were using the 80 millimeter refractor. The black and white screen is going to be my guide scope. Now as you see I'm aligned at the base of this phone pole approximately one half a mile away across the lake from me. You see the little phone box next to it, here's the pole, here's the light that I use for focusing sometimes. But the crosshairs are directly on the base of the phone pole. Now if you look over on the guide scope you'll see that the center of the image is also right at the base of that phone pole. Now, you will notice that this angle right here, although close, is not quite the same as this one. This is to do two things. The first one is to demonstrate that as long as you are relatively close, you can get a good polar alignment. And the other thing is, my practice manager has some OCD, and this will drive her insane because it's slightly off. Now, just so you know what we're dealing with, this is one of my telescopes. That's an Explore Scientific German Equatorial Mount. It's a computerized go-to amount. You see the computer right next to it. I connect that with my main computer inside using a LAN cable. I've got a couple of cameras on the uh, telescope right now. They're ZWO cameras. The main one is a ZWO-294. And the guide scope camera is a black and white ZWO-120. The telescope itself is a Stellar View 80 millimeter refractor and it's pretty much set up for action right now. So let's go ahead and polar align this bad boy. So the first step is to put the telescope into polar home position. That means it's pointing north, the weights are down, preferably it's nighttime and the lens cap is off. But that's the position. And then what you're going to do is start up the program Sharp Cap. So the way you do a polar alignment in Sharp Cap is really elegant. What you do is you go up here to the tools and you just hit polar alignment and you'll get this screen right here. I've hooked up my guide camera, which is the black and white camera to this, and it's taken a picture of the sky, basically what the telescope is seeing. Sharp Cap then plate solves and identifies all of these stars and figures out where the North Celestial Pole is. The North Celestial Pole may or may not be in the screen. So even though we just pointed it with a little Kentucky windage, we actually came up with a pretty good image here, and the North Celestial Pole is visible in the image. So now it's instructed me to go ahead and hit Next down here, and it wants to take a second picture. Let me show you what happens when you hit Next. Now, as you recall, the telescope was initially in polar home position. When you hit Next, you need to rotate the telescope 90 degrees, kind of like that. Now what happens when you do that is you create a star trail. Let me show you. So I'm out at the telescope right now and I'm going to rotate it 90 degrees just as I showed you in the picture. Let's see what happens. And there we are. Notice that this star right here is Polaris. Now it started off down here, but as we rotated the scope it formed an arc. Now that arc has got a radius and a center. Now what Sharp Cap is going to do is it's going to look at the radius of that arc and figure out that the center of that arc is right around here. Let's go ahead and see what it does. Now here we go. This star has been identified as Polaris. 
the North Celestial Pole is here, and our telescope, our mount, is actually pointing at this red dot. Remember the arc that came up here? That's the center of the arc. And it's telling me I'm about 10 minutes of angle off of the North Celestial Pole. So that would be about 10 minutes of angle right there. Let's go see where we go from here. Now when we hit next, it'll actually tell me what direction in azimuth I need to move it. So it says I need to move it 7 minutes and 39 seconds to the right in azimuth. And I'm a little bit high, so I need to move the mount down. Now on the front of the mount, you'll see these two large knobs. What they do is they move the telescope in azimuth, left and right. The screw in the middle with the handle on it moves the telescope down. But most of the up and down motion is done from the back, and that's right here. Here's the other side of the screw. What this does is it tilts the entire telescope up, and the one in the front tilts it downward. That little green dot is a bubble level to make sure that the mount itself is level. Now you can adjust the legs with these sets of screws down here at their bases, and that'll kind of level the scope a little bit based on that bubble level. Now the key to this is make tiny little adjustments, and then let SharpCap solve the picture before you make another adjustment because it's very easy to overshoot. So let's go ahead and watch me go through the alignment procedure on my telescope last night. Now one thing that you'll notice, here's where the telescope mount is pointing. Here's the North Celestial Pole. Now to help you align these, what it'll do is it'll pick a star and it'll say you have to move that star into this little box. And if you do that, then the North Celestial Pole will match up with where your telescope mount is pointing. See, making tiny little movements, waiting for it to solve, right here. If you get impatient, and try and move it before it solves, you may end up overshooting. As you see, I'm doing that a little bit here. The other problem that I ran into last night was there was quite a bit of wind hitting the telescope, and that makes it vibrate just very slightly. It's enough to kind of mess with this a little bit because this is very fine work that we're doing right now. See how it's kind of homing in? I'm trying to get that star in the box, and I'm following the directions. It says I need to go right 49 seconds and up 4 minutes. Now we're getting smaller, getting closer. Getting very close. Now one of the keys to doing this is when you see excellent, stop. Because if you don't, you're going to start chasing around little atmospheric shimmers, but we're within about 10 arc seconds of the pole right now. That's good enough. Now you'll notice when we started this procedure, even though we did a pretty good job visually of lining up to where the North Celestial Pole should be, we were actually off a little bit on the mount. The mount is pointing where that red cross is. The North Celestial Pole is the green cross. That's probably good enough for visual observations because your eye doesn't blur or get star trails like a long exposure camera would get. But when you're doing exposures that are two minutes or more, you have to have very precise polar alignment. So we go through the procedure and we end up with something like this. So now we're properly polar aligned. The next thing we have to do is make sure that our focus is nice and crisp. Let me go ahead and show you how to do that. Now what I've done here is I've hooked the telescope up to something called ASCOM, which is the program that allows the telescope to talk to my computer. And then I've also linked it to this, Stellarium. We've used this in the past. Now I knew where the telescope was, and what I did was I directed it to go down to Vega, which is a bright star in my northeast sky. And I took a picture and lo and behold Vega wasn't there. So I did a plate solve and as it turns out the telescope is actually pointing just below it. So I'm going to direct it to go to Vega and then we're going to take some pictures. So what I'm doing right now is that I opened up Astrophotography Tool and I'm using my guide camera and I've located Vega. 
It's this large star right here in the middle, and it found it almost exactly. Now we're going to go over to SharpCap, where I have my color camera hooked up, and here's Vega again. Notice that these stars are all out of focus. That's not any good. So what we're going to do is we're going to use something called a Batonoff mask. Let me show you what that is. Now what a Batonoff mask is, is it's a disc that you put over the end of your telescope. That's very similar to the one that I have. But notice that it's got slits in it that are 120 degrees offset. The result is that you'll get diffraction spikes on a star. You need to pick a nice bright star and have your gain set properly. But this is a focusing aid. But tonight we're using Vega, and let's go see in real life how it works. So here we go. Just making some minor adjustments to the image, and we're going to put the Batonoff mask on the telescope. Now notice how bloated looking the stars are. They're definitely out of focus. You can see that they're stars, but they're not nice and sharp and crisp like we'd like them. Okay, so here comes the Batonoff mask. Now notice when I first put it on, it's a little jiggly, so it's not quite sharp. But here we are. Now here are the two main diffraction spikes. Notice that they cross right through the star. However, this third one is off to the side a little bit. That's because the telescope is a little out of focus. What we need to do is we need to bring this spike over in this direction a little bit so it's centered right on the star between these two other spikes. Let's go watch that. Notice when I touch the telescope, it blurs a little bit. It looks like it might have gone the wrong way on that. We'll bring it back the other way. Now you can actually use sharp cap to tell you how far you're off. I prefer to just use my eye for right now. But sharp cap will actually analyze this image and tell you how far that spike is off and how much and in what direction you need to move it. See, we're getting a little bit better. I think it's still a little bit more to the right. needs to come a little bit more to the left. That's actually looking pretty good right there. Now once again, here's Vega. But look at these stars out here. You see how they're now different little pinpoints of light and they're actually stars of different sizes? You might even begin to notice a little color in here too. Now the fact that there's a little bit of green in the background is because on the camera the sensors uh, are grouped into four sets. There are two green pixels, a red pixel, and a blue pixel. So there's a little bit of a green bias. Plus we have a full moon tonight and there's a lot of moonlight out there causing light pollution and that comes up as green as well. So. Now we're polar aligned. We've got our camera in tight focus. Let's go ahead and do some observing. We have a beautiful full moon tonight. As you can tell, the moon is extraordinarily bright. So we need to make some adjustments on the exposure length and the gain and look at some contrast and see if we can bring out some details of that full moon. So this is the actual shot that I got last night. One thing that struck me as kind of interesting is notice the moon is in pretty good coloration right now. This is a pretty decent exposure. But Aristarchus out here has got a real hot spot in it. This is not uncommon. Occasionally you will see a very bright light or spot in Aristarchus, and I think that's what we're looking at tonight. It's the first time I've personally seen it, but there it is. So, this is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Thank you for stopping by and clear skies and have fun with astronomy. Rabbit holes too deep
the science guy. 